this week. Zach Schlumpf, recruiting coordinator for IO Active, joins us for a feature interview in our articles for discussion. We're going to talk about, I thought that said whining. It's actually winning, winning. Maybe it's winning, whining arguments. No, it's winning arguments, uh, turning insight into execution and avoiding the yes dilemma. In the news, we've got a lot of updates from, big updates from Bitdefender, McAfee, Barracuda Networks, Pony Express, Reversing Labs, and more. Stay tuned for this edition of Startup Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show about security startups, how to secure your startup, and advice for security startups, it's Startup Security Weekly. I need it from the top. Brought to you by Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV's courses live and on demand worldwide, so there's no need to send staff to off site training. Their team solution provides access to a supervisor portal for full control over your team's training schedule and group analytics. Go to itpro.tv forward slash startup security and use the code SS30 to try it free for seven days and receive. 30% off your monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. To learn more about IT Pro TV's team solution, sign up for a free demo of their supervisor portal. Are you looking for a career where you can make a real difference? Accenture Security is looking for passionate, creative minds to tackle some of the biggest security threats facing us today. Innovative thinkers who want to outmaneuver cyber criminals. They're hiring specialists across the spectrum, from security strategy to cyber defense, digital identity and application security, helping to deliver holistic solutions. If you want to use next generation technologies and global resources to change the future of security, visit Accenture.com forward slash security careers. Welcome, everyone, to the Raspberry Pi program today. This is not the Raspberry Pi program, although it should be, uh, which is awesome. It looks like I have three Raspberry Pis when, in fact, it's just one. And through the magic of technology, it looks like I have three, uh, which is great. Uh, welcome to Startup Security Weekly. This is, in fact, December 1st. I am your host, Paul Asadorian, joined on the lines via Skype, the sand hobo himself, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo, welcome to the program. It's excited to be here. You I, sound uh, excited. I had, to turn up, I had to turn up the temperature, Paul, because I apparently was too warm before. You're too hot. So hopefully you know I'm, what it is? You're too I'm coming hot. in cool, baby. Yeah. I want to be cool for you. <laughs> You're always cool, sort of. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's going to be one of those shows uh, today. I it, it feels like one of those shows. I, just, I poured water. I, I made a gross error in judgment today. There, there should be more bourbon or something. Um, <clears throat> you can hear from Larry Pesce and myself this week. Larry and I are doing a webcast with Pony Express. It's going to be so awesome and exciting. Larry and I are going to talk about uh, wireless attacks, wireless attacks in the enterprise, some of the threats that are facing you uh, with an IoT twist, which is uh, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, IoT threats in the enterprise. Paul Paget, uh, who is now the senior vice president of strategy, vice president of strategy, I want to say, strategic initiatives, something like that. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk more about. Excuse me. We'll talk more about Point Express later on in the program. Um, so that's going to be fun. Paul's going to come down here to the studio. Uh, hopefully, Larry will be here in the studio to have all three of us in the same room. It's just, I mean, you're just going to want to watch it just for that, really. It's just all three of us in the same room. Um, Larry and I have known Paul for a long time uh, from previous endeavors, so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. That's happening next Thursday, December 7th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can register for that at securityweekly.com forward slash pony. I would like to introduce our special guest for this evening. It's Zach Schlumpf. Hopefully that's the last time I have to say your last name because every time I say it, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Uh, who's the recruiting coordinator <clears throat> for IO Active? He's an Army vet and former Army veteran, former former Red Teamer. I can't talk today. Volunteer with Seattle Lock Sport and various conventions. Zach, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, Paul. Appreciate I didn't it. recognize you without your kilt. 
I know, I know. We were just, we were like twins there almost. I know. Starbucks, Zach and I were like, kilts. We're like kilt brothers. Like, we, I, I thought more people were going to wear kilts. Not that I care. I but know. It was, that was I, the only time I saw anyone wear kilts at HushCon, or uh, excuse me, uh, Derby. It was kind of funny. These DefCon, they're everywhere. HushCon, yeah. there's a few of them. But uh, it yeah, was like me. The only kilted guys over at Derby. Yeah, it was like me and you and like maybe one other person on, I think it was yeah. the Friday of, uh, of Shmoocon. See, now I'm getting the name I'm... wrong. Good Lord of DerbyCon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. In any case, it's nice to have you. Um, nice so, to see you, man. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about uh, recruiting and, and getting jobs as I think it really intersects with our conversation conversations here on Startup Security Weekly because one of the things that you're tasked with when you do a startup uh, is hiring people, <laughs> and that's it's Absolutely. such a critical you know part of the business, whether it's a, a new startup or a growing business, or as is the case with Security Weekly, right? I uh, transitioned from Attainable and and went to grow and build uh, Security Weekly full time. I essentially had to uh, you know start over and have a whole recruiting process and, and fill lots of positions because I was in a, a growth mode. Uh, and we mm-hmm. talk about how startups are in a growth mode, but as your business grows, you hit various stages of growth that may, uh, such as a funding round, um, you force you to go out and, and hire people. Uh, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Michael, do you have anything to add to, to set the stage for our conversation today? No, I mean, it's, I think you did a great job. I'm going to stop right there. I'm looking forward to getting into the conversation because I think there's a lot here to talk about. So Zach, you had a very technical uh, background you're a red teamer. Uh, uh, sort of technical. Sort of technical. <laughs> more social. <laughs> well, that would explain why you're in more of a social uh, role. Today. So what was it like kind of – like how did you make that transition uh, from being in the Army uh, to being a red teamer and then now to it being doing recruiting in the security community for uh, a very technical role, I'm assuming? Well, uh, yeah, so I ended up using my GI Bill from the military. I was in the infantry. Uh, didn't do any tours, really. Went over to Korea, drank a lot. That was about it. <laughs> <laughs> I drank a lot. Uh, I was about two miles from the DMZ at a little base called Camp Greaves, and there wasn't a whole lot to do over there. So, But anyway, fast forward a few years, used my GI Bill, got into uh, IT stuff, uh, mostly because I was lockpicking. I knew a lot of the local hackers and um I was saying, hey, I pick locks, and they're like, oh, we do too. What? There's other lock pickers out there? So I ended up uh, meeting up with them, went to DEF CON. I'm like, wow, this this is pretty cool. So I ended up getting into uh, just a two-year course for IT, talked my way into a uh, social engineering position, essentially, for an internship with a, a local company. It's a uh, was a little bit of a pen test puppy mill, and I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time there. And uh, so I still wanted to be part of the industry. I didn't really enjoy that, but uh, like exactly. I said, I, 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 just, I just want to back up because I, I I can't let go of this, that you had to talk your way into a social engineering position. Hmm. I'd imagine that that's how it happens if you're going to be a social yeah, engineer, irony, right? right? <laughs> they expect you to do some social engineering to get the position. I think that was great. Right. So um, after the military, I was a door guy at bars and clubs and whatnot. So having people skills is a little important when you don't want to have to go to the hands-on customer service to get people outside sometimes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I got good with talking to people, you know, so, uh, and I enjoy working with people. I like people. It's uh, everywhere you go. Of course, social engineering, people are the weakest link. So being nice to them uh, seemed to work out pretty well. So we were working on banks and, and credit unions for the most part. And uh, just calling people up, being nice to them went a long ways in my opinion. So um, we had a couple of coworkers that played the other side of the card. They'd just be disgruntled. Oh, I got to get this thing done. I need you to go check this thing on the network really quick. Here, check this link. And and sometimes that'd work. But I, I seem to have better success just being nice to people. And then again, I also felt kind of bad doing it because they're trying to help, a, you know, a coworker. Right. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So uh, I decided to go a little bit different. I said, hey, I have all these people skills. What else could I use it for? How can I stay in the industry still and, and be helpful? I was like, recruiting, why, why not? That's that's entirely people. Uh, what can I do to help out? I, I could get people jobs. Let's let's give that a shot. And uh, just serendipitously, I was on the way to CanSec, where I, I helped volunteer with that with Dragos' uh, big convention up there. Uh, and my friend Noid and I were on the train going up to CanSec, and he's like, so what are you up to? What do you think about it? I was like, well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about doing recruiting. Uh, I'm going to look into that, see if I can maybe find an internal recruiter somewhere and uh, do some informational interviews. By happenstance, the recruiter for IO Active was sitting in front of me at the time. 
uh, Christy Miller, and she pops around the seat. She goes, "Hey, I'm Christy. I'm the recruiter at Iowa Active. Let's yeah. talk." <laughs> so it was uh, it was great. It was great timing. That's great. I so love she was her. very nice. Yeah, and she was very nice. Incredibly yeah. nice. That's like that's one of my favorite lines out of Roadhouse, right? Be nice, <laughs> and you know, if they insult you, be nice. Be nice until it's time to not be nice. Yeah, exactly. I guess yeah. I guess that's and Paul's job to tell us when it's time to not be nice. That's right. <laughs> We're usually nice. But, I usually say give great... a mouse a cookie, too. So if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. So sometimes you have these long conversations with trying to get people out the door. <laughs> hey, man, you have too much to drink. Oh, can I just can I just finish this up? Oh, yeah, yeah, have another. just finish your beer. It's cool. Oh, hey, I got to use the bathroom. Can I use the bathroom? Okay, man, it's, you, you got to go. You got to go outside. Come on, <laughs> you know. So it's uh, there was a, a, a real thin line of being polite but being stern with people. And, you know, it's the bars were fun, but uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's good to be out of them. <laughs> well, it's it's a great story, Zach, and I think it uh, it's a great testament to our security community as well. Um, and you know, you don't have to necessarily pigeonhole yourself in one role or or the other. And I think a lot of people think, well, I have to be uh, in depth yep. technical and write exploits. That's you know, mm-hmm. that's a very valid skill and an important skill. Um, but when we look at the business side of things, you have to take what skills you have. You have to take what you want to achieve in your career and, and, and go after it and that you shouldn't think about how uh, you'd be pigeonholed into a certain role. You said, hey, I want to go do recruiting and uh, as luck would have it and, and certainly skill and effort and that's what you did, which is great. Um, so Zach, what, let's say I, I have a startup and <clears throat> I want to frame this discussion because I mean, this is where John Strand and I, you know, basically were and, and are to, to a certain extent. And we have a lot of visions and we need people to help us uh, <laughs> fill out our vision and, and achieve our goals. And in this case, let's say we need to hire people who can write code and, and create software. How, how do you recommend that we recruit for that? Because I think a lot of startups and a lot of businesses are in that same position today where they need to hire people to build stuff, to build software what kind of qualities do you look for uh, in, in software developers? Well, I think I would uh, first, I, I try to go things about a little differently. I mean, you go on LinkedIn, you could send in mail to people and, and do that kind of normal standard recruiter thing. Hey, I work at such and such. I'm doing this thing. Come check me out here. I do. We have this cool stuff ready. Or you can go to find out where they're passionate. Uh, there's a lot of cool meetups that I go to. Uh, if I'm looking for something specific, software-wise, I, I mean, personally, I'm not doing any uh, engineer kind of positions. It's not mm-hmm. what I look for. But if I was, there are amazing amounts of uh, meetups out there specifically for different languages. Uh, I think that's the sort of route I'd go. I'd go buy some people beers and talk to them about what they're working on, what they like. And uh, if it's uh, local, I mean, it's, that's easy. Uh, if it's uh, for something remote, that might be a little more difficult. And the, the more standard kind of internet uh, job opportunities I think would be a little bit better that way but um, I think meetups and, and finding people uh, in person is what I try to do it's so refreshing to hear you say that Zach it really is <laughs> it, it, but I think that's a really good message to send to founders to be uh, say you know if you've got this idea to, to build something to get involved with your with your local community uh, to have a beer with someone or you know, hang out at a, a conference maybe share some of your vision as you know Michael and I recommend that companies that go into this really deep stealth mode that that's not necessarily the way that you want to roll and share a little bit of your vision, see how that person reacts to that. And then, you know, make some determinations. I think that's a great, uh, a great point. <clears throat> Michael questions along those lines. Well, yeah, I want to start with a point and then I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to the question that, I mean, the point, and this is something we talk about in the show a lot. When we're, when we're looking at anything that has to do with the business of security, Right. It works whether you're a vendor, it works whether you're a startup, it works whether you're a team. And the, the, I I feel like I keep saying I've been vocal about this. So I'm just going to keep being vocal about it. I don't see that we really have a talent gap or a talent shortage. So let me let me start this way, because I, I think and I think Zach and I agree on this and we traded some messages beforehand. A lot of the way we traditionally recruit, I don't want to go so far as to say it's broken. So why don't we just say it's broken and it doesn't work very well? And and what Zach just said was go go meet people mm-hmm. in person and be nice and figure out if you like each other and, and go mm-hmm. from there. So what you know when I look at this, I'm kind of curious. You know, do you think 
that we have this talent gap. Like Zach, by going to where where you can find cool people that share similar interests that you think would be great fits for what you're trying to do, are do you feel like you you just they're they're not out there? You can't find them. No, uh, they're there. Uh, the problem is, is, you know, finding them through the large amounts of people going to conventions and stuff like that. I, at DerbyCon, for instance, I was one of the, the volunteers there, and I talked to lots and lots of people. Uh, it just depends on the position you're looking for and the, the headcount for it. Um, I think we have a mentorship problem in, in security, personally. Oh, I agree uh, with that, yeah. What a lot of it is, and one of the things, like I said, I'm not super technical. I, I know what's what i know the right words and here and there i know how to do a semi-technical interview but when it comes down to it I, there's i mean everyone's way better than i am out there and i know that i'm i'm at best a skid you know so i, I could use some tools i could i could poke some buttons and i could do the right thing but there's people out there that design tools and things like that and they could go off on tangents about how cool this one specific thing is and i want to talk to them uh i met thomas who made aircrack ng at, at derby and we talked for hours about just you know cool stuff if I wanted a wireless guy, I'd, I'd be talking to him if he didn't have anything else going on. Um, but as far as the mentorship goes, uh, a lot of it, there's a lot of old timers, the senior folk, and they're like, well, learn how to do it yourself. That's what I did. It's like, but you have this wealth of knowledge that you could probably convey, and I could skip a lot of the hitting my head against the wall thing for, for hours of trying to do it incorrectly and be like, oh, I, I missed a dash. I missed uh, you know an argument that I should have put in there, and that's what's been driving me crazy. Oh, I didn't tab the right way and have the right white space in this Python program, you know, and that could save some time. So having good mentorship, I think is incredibly important. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed and, and, and helped out. And there are great mentors out there. Uh, Leslie Hex for pancakes. She does things like resume workshops and stuff like that. And, and has all sorts of resources to help people. I think that's fabulous and we need more of it. So Michael's stance is that, uh, and, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, that you believe we don't have, is it a knowledge or a skills gap or both? Or is there, do you make a delineation between the two? No, I, I think we probably need to make a delineation and that's where I get fair. What, what I find is we chronically say there's a shortage. And then from that, we'll say, well, there's either not enough people or there's not enough talent or there's not enough skills or whatever else. But then we meet people like Zach who say, no, I, I found a way. I, I go meet people. I'm nice. I figure out what they're up to. Uh, in any time, let me just be, be more simple. Anytime I meet somebody who tells me they have a shortage, if I ask them, right, you know, our questions, what problem are you trying to solve? What value does that create? If you hire that position, if you hire a person into that position, how is that valuable? What do they get done as a result? How are they going to get value out of it beyond the paycheck? What's your vision look like? I find the people who tell me they have a talent shortage can't answer any of those questions, Paul. <laughs> but anytime somebody can answer those questions, they've got people lining up to be able to work with them. And so my position is there are inefficiencies in our current marketplace and it may be talent, it may be skills, but I, I think we can hire for that. And I think then, right, and, and lest we get too buzzwordy, but we keep presenting all the people that are giving us artificial intelligence and machine learning and new solutions. Yeah. Tech should be offloading stuff that that we don't need people to do anymore, and we can free up the talented folks to go cool solve really cool problems, and the people who are newer to it, we can build their skills. But you know, like Zach pointed out, we don't have a mentorship, uh, established mentorship, and and the quick aside on that is we don't even know what it means to be a mentor versus an advisor versus a coach, and that's that's a huge difference there. Uh, but also, we, we don't do good at development. We we don't, in most places, have an ability to say, wow, I like your skills, I like your aptitudes, and we're going to train you. We're going to level you up. And when we get people in, we're not necessarily good at leveling them up so they can stay or they can grow or they can take on leadership roles. Those are more structural issues. If we solve some of those things, a lot of these other problems go away. By the way, every industry tells me they've got shortages today, which means there's no shortages. We just don't know how to communicate, and we don't know what, what we're solving for. Zach, uh, many people have uh, spoken with me over the years, and they view what we do, and I think there's people in our field that have the same view, whether they're conscious of it or not, that what we do as hackers, as the penetration testers or the security professionals is somewhat of a black art. Right. It's this oh, super it's secret cybery. thing. Yeah. It's this super <laughs> like secret thing. And and I mean there's reasons for that. But when you go out into the marketplace to try and find people to fill positions, do you find mm -hmm. that they're like, 
well, I don't really know that security thing because as Michael said, and you also said too, like no one's really mentored me and, and taught me what I needed to know uh, about this black art. Like, do they have that perception? And if they do, how do you overcome it to say, no, you actually might be the right fit? Well, we're entirely security here, so I, I don't really have to deal with that issue as much. Um, but uh, like you said, I mean, I, I think media has a good portion to betray that. I mean, people are hacking, you know, driving really quick in, in a car to cat, pass a cat cable over to the airplane for whatever that was. And, you know, you get things like that. Um, there are some people that have learned. I mean, there's a lot of security professionals, Kevin Mitnick, uh, you know, for instance, he went to jail for doing cybercrime, right? So now he's a well-known security researcher and whatnot. So there are examples of people doing the bad guy stuff and turning good after a while, you know, from different well, means. I'm sorry, Tech, not necessarily the – I'm not talking about things that are illegal, but in other words, <clears throat> the way we develop exploits and tools – and oh, gotcha. It's magic. Things is, sure. is like magic. It's like black arts. Sure. And I think someone yeah. who might be a very talented systems administrator or network engineer or DevOps person may say, I don't I don't get the whole black arts thing that you do. Like, I know it's not illegal, but like you do all this stuff and I don't know what it means. And it's like, no, you, you have the right skills. You just Dragon. need a mentor yeah. or coach in security. So do you take people that uh, like maybe have that mindset of, I don't understand that security thing. And you're like, no, you're the right candidate. You know, here's how we'll bring you in and coach. Oh, absolutely. You. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think like sysadmins, network ad, uh, engineers and whatnot, I, I think they have a, a great base. I talked to a guy who was entirely blue team that wanted to start dipping his toes into the red team stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's, a, they have an amazing background. Me personally, as when I started with, you know, I jumped into red team immediately. Did I suffer because I didn't have a great background? I had a two year, you know, uh, associate's degree from a, a college for, you know, information technology. And that was about it. So would it have helped if I had a better background? Absolutely. Um, one of the ways I, I talk to people about it is it get extremely nerdy and get into some Dungeons and Dragons here because I'm a nerd is it's like a prestige class. You start with a good basis of knowledge, and after a while you get these skills, and you can say, hey, I could use this in a different way. How do, how do the bad guys do things? What could I do to change my tactics to make this more offensive? What could I do to prevent that? Hey, there's this glaring security thing I missed because I looked at something differently. So I think that's pretty important, yeah. Uh, not necessarily meaning you have to start off with those set of skills. I mean, you can develop those down the road for sure, but... Um, it, it's definitely a mentality thing, for sure. When what do you I, think of the help desk, Zach? I'm sorry, sorry, Paul. I just, we just we, we, I, I, I think it, ahead, Michael. I think an untapped place is the help desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, so have Absolutely. you talked to people yeah. that that have worked the help desk? Because I mean, think about it. They have to learn to be nice. They have to learn yeah, to well, explain well. things. They have to have patience. Yep. Oh, and they got to be pretty conversant across a whole bunch of stuff, typically. Absolutely. And I, I think help desk. I don't is think great. we tap into that nearly enough. And I, I, I've never met anybody who said, you know, my career ambition is to work a help desk. Like I see that as that's how you get your foot in the door. That's how you get started. I think it's a great totally. way to get experience. I don't understand why we're not doing a better job of leveling people up and say, hey, those of you who have these interests, come follow yeah. us, <laughs> right? It's I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my coworkers, that was a phenomenal red teamer. He, he came from a, a help desk background. And like you said, you got to get people skills. You'll be able to talk to people. And soft skills, I think, are incredibly underrated. You, great, you write some amazing code. Well, you can't talk to people very well. That doesn't really help sometimes, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, it's calls, crazy how we call them soft skills. We call them soft skills, yep. and they are so hard to acquire. <laughs> they are. It's, uh, Absolutely. it's crazy. But the, the help desk example is great because it's not just the soft skills, air quote, soft skills that you're acquiring. It's also exposure to a lot of different technology and how that technology yep. works. The other big thing that you get as a help desk is your ability to troubleshoot. Those totally. of us that have done anything in security, yeah. network yeah. systems administration, yep. have spent probably half of our career figuring out why something doesn't work. <laughs> and that is, it, regardless of how well you know the technology or not, the skill of troubleshooting is something that can be learned from working in a help desk. And so I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to embrace that as a career path for people. Because what I see is that uh, students are graduating from a degree program in security and they just, they want to go start being a level one SOC analyst. And they, yep. quite frankly, have no idea what they're looking at because they haven't spent time as a help desk person, as a systems administrator or a network engineer. Zach, how closely do you look at those skills of building a foundation before you're uh, hiring someone into your organization? 
Oh, it's absolutely helpful. Uh, like I said, well, from my experience, I didn't have that background, and I, I definitely struggled because of it. It would have helped me out substantially if I had a good base uh, doing help desk. Uh, it was one of the things I was after I ended up leaving that company. It's like, well, maybe I could go back to and, and look into something else. Maybe I'll go help desk. Maybe I'll try to do uh, a junior systems administrator kind of work, you know? And uh, I think it helps out greatly. Um, now, we also have a lot of, like you said, people coming out of uh, degree programs, uh, bachelors in, in cybersecurity, masters in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. and they have no experience. And, and that's difficult because it's like, great, you have this cool degree. You might have a couple certs under your belt, but that's not real world applicable, uh, which is unfortunate. And and so they, you know, they spent a whole bunch. Of, I, I just spent four years in school learning about this IT thing and, and specifically security, and I can't get a job. Well, you can't just jump into it, uh, you know, head first. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. Go ahead, Michael. Well, why, you know, I've talked to a lot of CISOs, and they, they've echoed the same thing. They've said, you know what? We get these kids uh, out of school, and, and I apologize. I appreciate if you're 21, 22 years old, you, you don't want to be called a kid anymore. But you've you've completed your degree program. You, you're very excited. You've studied cybersecurity. You've you've read the case studies. You've done the casework, and you're really excited. And what I'm hearing is, and it's very much what you guys are saying. No, no actual hands-on keyboard experience, no practical experience, no, no ability to apply it, no ability to apply it under pressure. So my question then is let's look at the other way. If you're watching this program today, and I know we, we have a lot of folks that, that pay attention that are in that situation, they're getting the degree program. Zach, what do they need to do so that when they're out, they can say, yes, look, I have a degree, but I've also done this and this and this, and this is why I'm a good candidate for good you. Question. How do we solve that on the other way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things I always look for, and I tell people, I, I try to help out with resumes when I can, is, hey, if you have a home lab set up where you tinker with things, let me know. What do you? What's your home network look like? Mm. What do you do? What hands-on experiences do you have? Do you go to any conventions? Do you go to meetups where you actually you know, put hands-on keyboard and do things? Uh, are you part of any groups? Like uh, there's uh, the local uh, UW, uh, University of Washington uh, CTF group. Batman's Kitchen uh, or uh, CCDC kind of things where they actually do hands-on uh, practical stuff. Uh, that's incredibly important. That looks way better than a cert, in my opinion. I, I've told this story uh, on the show in the past. I don't know if uh, Zach or Michael has heard it. When I was applying for uh, my second systems administrator job, which I was happened to be hired because I had some firewall experience and they were getting firewalls, but the Unix systems administrator team was interviewing me and asking me questions about what technologies that I that I knew. And I said, well, yeah, I know NFS. I said, I have that set up at home. They're like, wait, what do, what do you mean you have that set up at home? What do you mean? I'm like, well, I have a, a lab at home. I have this, you know, big server rack in my, in my mom's living room. They're like, well, hold on. In your mom's living room, because I was living at home at the time, <laughs> you've got a server rack extensive enough that you're running NFS between multiple systems. I'm like, yeah, you want to see a picture? And they just kind yep. of like, so I pull out from my folder and I, I hand them a picture and they're like studying the picture, recognizing like different pieces of hardware. And in, lo and behold, I, I got the job and it was a pivotal right. in my career that I, I held that position uh, at the university where I was able to build a security program from the ground up. And that's one of the stories I tell the people that are looking to get into security, that those are the things like Zach mentioned, participating in D CCDC and having a home lab. I can speak from personal experience how greatly that has helped me uh, mm -hmm. in my career to achieve my goals. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's paramount, to be honest, because I, I look at our resume and say, OK, you have this language, you have this set of skills. Tell me how you use it practically. Like, do you have something at home? That's amazing. Tell, tell me more about that. And, you know, I ask people, okay, what's your home network look like? And people will go off on a, a diatribe for a yeah. long, long time, 10 minutes. And I'm trying to keep up taking notes. I'm like, this is amazing. Why didn't I ask this right off the bat? <clears throat> Zach, uh, uh, technology questions aside, mm -hmm. what questions do you ask candidates to gauge their aptitude towards being something like a penetration tester? And... I don't know if I want. So I, I know someone that asked this specific question, and I, I tend to ask it as well. Um, mm. They will ask the person, okay, imagine this scenario. You're inside of a room, and there's a light bulb screwed in, and the light is on. Describe for me how many different ways you could turn the light off in the room. And when they get through two or three different things, you say, okay, keep going. Okay, keep mm -hmm. going. And you just keep pushing them until they run out of ideas. I think ideally they should get to like six or seven and, and start getting more creative. And I think that's a really valid test, especially for someone who's a penetration tester, because 
It's thinking creatively about how to solve a problem. And you're going to have to do that when you break into someone's network. Do you have questions? And I understand if you don't want to share them all on air because it kind of you know lets the cat out of the bag. Not that it's a secret, well, right? But it gives people a chance to think about them, which could be a good or a bad thing. Um, but sure. do you have questions like that? Uh, not exactly. I, I like to talk more about the person. I, I go for really hard on cultural fit too, but there's definitely values in those questions. Uh, I try to ask them, tell me about a tool that you used somehow it wasn't designed for. I don't care about what something does I, or what it's for. I care about what it can do. If I can weaponize something, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question. How do you weaponize? Because that's, that's certainly part of the uh, candidate's skills that they have to have when they they're going for pen testing so that's great now is it just penetration testing that you're hiring for zach or are there other research roles and in, in how do you treat the different roles in terms of discovering the correct candidate uh well i mostly do the phone screens uh so i i say if a candidate's worthwhile moving on to a technical interview where mm -hmm. they could get into the nitty-gritty of things so i like i said I, I do a lot of cultural fit i try to see if they have a basis level uh like we said earlier if they understand what they're talking about to something we can use and if they do i move it on and say hey we have these uh uh directors of service that i would say hey this guy looks interesting mm -hmm. this person looks interesting i think they might have a fit what sort of work do we have available? Can I set you up for a phone call with uh, this candidate? And uh, the directors will go after and be like, yeah, actually, we do have work. That sounds good. Set me up with an interview. And they'll discuss, like I said, they'll get into the nitty gritty of things, what they do, what they what they can do, what they'd be useful for. <clears throat> you said a word that really uh, triggered our question, and that was culture. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of founders of early stage startups whether they're thinking about it uh, or not uh, consciously, they have an idea of what the culture, what kind of culture they want to create and breed for their organization. How do you determine if someone is going to fit into the culture? Yeah, that's that's a tough one, especially uh, in this industry, in security specifically. Uh, I think one of the best ways I've heard it is one of my friends, they say they have no asshole rule. <laughs> Which, it's, good. it's a good one. It's a good one. I think so. I, I think it's really important. Uh, and, and I mean, there's there's people in security that, that talk a lot and they don't actually produce results. And, and, and so that's, it's it's a different field. Uh, like I said, the, the, the security is a little different than, than normal things. So being able to parse that out and figure out, hey, this guy is actually pretty cool. He just doesn't talk all the time and actually can do some amazing stuff. That's great. And, and so trying to figure that out, like I said, I, I do a lot of personal questions uh, when I talk to candidates and, and make sure that they, they would be a good fit uh, because I think that's incredibly important, almost uh, equally as much as what they can do skill-wise. How, how many people do you interview that you're like, oh, my God, I could never put this person on site with a customer ever? <laughs> <laughs> how about some of the people you interview too i mean that's it's gonna be tough i mean having a bad interview sucks right it so, does uh, it does it does yeah, no it, you're it, absolutely it, right it's a very similar kind of thing fortunately yeah, it, we've been fortunate i've interviewed hundreds uh, of people in uh, the effort of this show and uh, largely i've been blessed with awesome interviews this one included, oh yeah so yeah but it's it's like pulling teeth sometimes trying to get uh, answers out of people so i mean being a friendly having a good approach trying to ask them easy questions to begin with to kind of warm people up, mm -hmm. uh, I think helps That's out a good lot. Tip. Good tip. Michael, more questions for Zach. No, I, I've been kind of enjoying it, actually. I mean, I, I think, Zach, you're making fantastic points. It's it's kind of refreshing to to see that. And I, so there, I think less of a question, more of a point, maybe we'll jump off from here. I think then that if you're if you're in one of those situations today, take some notes from Zach and, and, and take a look at it, right? Because I, I think this is one of those things where it's an inefficiency. If you're trying to recruit for a position, you need to have a better sense of what, what you're looking for and have a process that you're able to follow. If you're trying to get a position, I mean, there's no reason to show up to a conversation with Zach and not be able to answer his questions, especially the simple ones, and, and be conversant and convince Zach that you've got value and, and that you should move forward. Zach, what do you think the biggest challenge is? Like when, when you think about recruiting and, and as you've been looking at it and you've gone to the conferences and you've tried to sift through the noise and you've now looked at it from both sides, what do you think like categorically, what problem or problems do we need to think about to make this a little bit more efficient and a little bit better for everybody? That's that's the ongoing challenge, to be honest. I'm, I'm still pretty new at this. I've been doing uh, recruitment for about six-ish months. 
I'm, I'm brand new. I'm, I'm still shiny at this. So uh, I'm trying to figure that out. And I'm always up for uh, people to help with it. So I, like I said, I, I go out there. I try to be friendly. I try to not be the typical recruiter and forget people. It's tough because you got to deal with so many people. Uh, I ended up doing a, a few informational interviews with recruiters. And they're like, you're that uh, – uh, did you ever get that job with that thing? And I'm like, no, we we had an informational interview about recruiting. I'm trying to be like you. I'm trying to do that job. Like, oh, what was your name again? And it's it's tough. And so <laughs> be, be, you, you it's a lot that, of plate spinning. <laughs> you say that you have six months of experience with uh, recruiting, and that's far more experience than I think most founders have in the interview process. There are probably mm-hmm. many founders that – have this vision, they're creating a company and have never interviewed a candidate or maybe throughout their career, they could count on one hand the number of times they've had to sit down with a potential candidate and conduct an interview. What tips do you have for those people who are creating a company? They're the founders of the company, but they're also responsible for hiring people and they they basically have no clue. Like I realized I could probably count maybe on two hands the time I had to interview people so I really had to think about my strategy and approach, and I still believe I have a lot to learn. So what tips do you have? Yeah, that's tough. Interviewing and being interviewed is, is a skill set in itself, in my opinion. It's difficult uh, to come up on the spot with questions uh, and, and answers, I should say, uh, when you're being interviewed. Being the interviewer is, uh, as I said, also a skill set. Being able to talk to people, uh, being able to warm them up to be able to answer questions, to, to get them comfortable where they – you know, they're not scared out of their minds uh, is another uh, issue that has to be addressed because some people just have performance anxiety and, you know, they might be incredibly intelligent and just freeze up when they get a question. And then, you know, as soon as you get out of the interview, I know I've done it like, oh, I knew that. I Why, why couldn't I figure it out right then? So um, I like to make things a little bit more conversational personally. Like I said, I, I, I don't get into the, the really deep tech talk too much. Um, so talk to other people that do interviews, uh, get some mentorship again, mm-hmm. uh, very important. See if you can sit in on interviews. If you have uh, friends that do conduct interviews often, uh, reach out to them, ask them for help too. see what uh, works well for them. What doesn't work. There's some pretty awful questions. I, I, and they definitely, you know, float around on Twitter and whatnot of, of what not to do. <laughs> I try not to be one of those guys. That, you know, that is a great point, but I, I like what you said in that the, the best tip, is to make the person feel comfortable in the first part of the interview so that you get the, yeah. the actual results, right? Not, not And get past that kind of nervousness. I think that's mm-hmm. some great advice. So what, what, what are questions not to ask? Well, there's all the legalese questions where you're not allowed to ask, you know, uh, the, the HIPAA kind of questions where uh, those are just illegal. So yeah. I, I well, found that, out well, where a great over, point. Yeah, if you haven't so conducted it. So overseas, yeah. kind of weird. I get some really crazy resumes from people. So we're worldwide. We have uh, people over in Spain, uh, the UAE, all over. The, we have uh, Central America. And so I'll get resumes, and people tell me what they um, – you know, what their marital status. I got one that was single and looking, which was uh, a little different. We're not allowed to ask those kind of questions. And I'm like, <laughs> I was talking to my boss at the time, Christy, and I was like, Christy, why do they tell me this? And it's like, well, everywhere else in the world, it's okay. Here in the States, it's illegal. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so th- those are the ones I usually try to avoid talking about. You know, you can't ask somebody if they have kids, if they have a family, you know, what sort of family they have. Um, which do come up in conversation and, you know, they are very important points, but I can't ask directly about them and I won't. Um, so that, that is, uh, kind of a minefield at times. It seems like, yeah. <laughs> Michael, sorry, Michael, I think you're muted or something. I see your mouth moving, but no, no words are coming out. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, what, what questions, so I, I want to stay on that, but I want to, I want to nuance it a little bit differently. A lot of times we think oh, I know the questions to ask. These are the questions that are going to get me the right candidates. So instead of asking about the illegalities or legalities or things like that, what's kind of surprised you in terms of uh, not just approach, but actual a topic to talk about or a question that either, wow, that totally gave me nothing um, Mm -hmm. and you stopped asking it or something that you found. Maybe it came up in a conversation and you started to notice as a trend and you're like, oh, I should talk about this. Uh, maybe it's related to pen testing. Maybe it's related to security. Maybe it's not. But have you found 
something that's almost like a, in the last six months, a, a little bit of a trend, either in a positive or a negative, because that stuff to me is always curious. Well, I, one of my questions that, that I was uh, started off asking is tell me about yourself. And that one's tough because yeah. it puts people kind of on the spot. It's one of those kind of expected questions. You're, you're, you're looking, you know, it's a normal question. But asking that right off the bat, hey, I'm Zach, you know, let's have this interview. Tell me about yourself. Let's get you talking right away. And uh, people freeze up with that one a lot. I was I was shocked on that one, you know. Tell me about yourself. Well, it's, it's not super difficult, I would imagine. Tell me about your background, you know, what you've done, where you've been, what you, you know, the, the cool things you enjoy. But it's really tough because they don't know how to feel you out yet. That's like I said, that's why I like to warm people up. I tell them a little bit about my background, what I've done. I, I, I kind of start talking and lead the conversation into, this is what I've done. Tell me a little bit more about what you've done uh, and tell me a little bit more about this. And like I said, I get a resume, I look at it. They probably have some cool stuff. Not all resumes are great. Some people are in, in very intelligent and they write a poor resume. And then I have to kind of say, okay, I see a couple of little gems in here. Let's try to dig those out and look into them a little bit more. Let's get them talking about the things they're passionate about. And like I said, it's hard to stop that train once it gets going. Michael, more questions for Zach? I, I mean, we could probably keep chatting uh, for a while on it, but but I've enjoyed it. I, I want to go back because you, you made the point. I just want to echo it. Being nice to people and putting them at ease is such a better strategy than I'm going to be a hard ass. I'm going to throw all this technical stuff mm -hmm. at them. I'm going to try to trip them up. Because if you think about it, most people who are interviewing with you either really need the job or, mm -hmm. the, I mean, they're interviewing. There's very few people. Or Zach, maybe your experience is different. I find when I'm involved in these processes, there's very few people who are just, you know, I mean, I love everything I'm doing, but I'm just going to take the interview because it's good sport for me. There's usually something at stake. They're, they're interested, they're nervous, they're anxious. And yeah. now you're going to grill them and, and ramp right. that up. It's counterproductive. Oh, well, they want to work there. Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I, I, I enjoyed that. Like, like as I, as I've been listening to you, I've, I've nodded my head to a lot of it, but that's the one that I went, Oh, Man, I have seen so many people that like to them it's blood sport. I, oh, yeah, it's yeah. like a murder Interview. board, right? Yeah. I've got these questions. I am ready. Let's see how they do. They think they're good. Well, if they want to work here, wow, holy crap, dude! I don't want to work there. Stop. That, yeah. That's red no. flags to me right there. If I hear if I if I get any that sense from somebody, man, I'm out. You know, I don't want to work for a place that's going to try to get me. Mm. Yeah, that no. sounds awful. So what you? <laughs> all right, so. So on that front, though, you've already mentioned, right? So, so you're mm -hmm. nice to people. You try to put them at ease. You get them to talk about themselves, which it, it, look, it, it doesn't seem like it'd be a challenge. It's a challenge. There's a lot of reasons why. But you also said at one point you're big on cultural fit and making mm -hmm. sure somebody's going to fit. So how do you assess that? Uh, that's – yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's a tough one too. Um, when I get people kind of talking about themselves, again, this, this is where the social engineering kind of gets going. Um, people love to talk about themselves, and they are very, like I said, some people are better at it than others, and some people just go off on, on tirades about cool things they've done and, oh, I did this. It, negative um, kind of uh, verbiage and whatnot, wordage, uh, is, is really paramount, I think, uh, when it comes to people talking about what they've done. Talking negatively about various uh, things that they've uh, mm. like previous companies, kind of a warning side to me. Uh, if they're infallible, that's also a little bit of a worry. Oh well, I would have done this if it wasn't for this guy holding me back, or, or some such. You know, as an example, um, that's one of the things I look about. Are they are they positive? Do they have you know good energy for lack of a better phrase? Um, are they enjoyable to talk to? Um, do I think they could get along with other people easily? Um, and that's part of why I ask what cons do you go to? What sort of social engagements do you do to see if you are friendly out there? I, most of the time we get referrals from people. I'm going to go to the referrals. Hey, what do you think about so-and-so? Tell me a little bit more about them. Get a little bit more background on them. So. No, it's, it's all good points. I, 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 I like particularly like the fact where you sit someone down from an interview and you walk away that you're like, did I enjoy talking to that person? That speaks volumes to cultural fit, right? Like that's a, yeah, a, good, a good indicator. <clears throat> well, Zach, thank you so much for appearing on Startup Security Weekly. Uh, it was wonderful having you and, and talk about how uh, companies in all stages, startup or otherwise, can improve their uh, recruiting process. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was great talking to you guys. 
With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about some startup articles for discussion on the topics of leadership, innovation, and startup success. Stay tuned.